for our country. Okay. Yes. So. I do not know. We could do it away. Is that speaker on there? Oh, let me check. Speaker's on. We have volume. Can you talk you just need... so we can make sure you can yes. hear me out here? <laughs> um, that was not audible. <laughs> the problem's in the audio. <laughs> Say it again, Dad. Hello, hello, I love cookies. Talk a little quieter. Talk normal. Okay, I can talk normal. Hey, Boston, Katie, why? I'm from USC. Okay, here we go. <laughs> or lack of onliners. Okay, yes. Book of Romans, Chapter what? 3. What a book. Yeah, it probably is. Yep. The guy's night out thing. Where'd you get the picture, Greg? Uh, from, I don't have my from church from either your page or the group or something. Okay, any idea where he's at? We don't ever put captions, so I don't ever know. Where he's at. <laughs> it looks like he's at church. There's red. Maybe well, he's I mean, that's the other church. Maybe that's from. Uh, oh, is that the other church? I can tell because see the cord for the blind? Uh huh. It's got red walls. Maybe it was at that wedding. We had cords. We had cords. Maybe it was at that wedding. Yeah, I, think, I don't think that was Sharon Hall. Really? Yeah, yeah it was no. within the that last year. Did they have blinds? No, we didn't have blinds. They got I red. was thinking it's a restaurant. That we yeah, restaurant. Red walls and. Yeah. Like maybe a Bob Evans. Hey, there he is. How do we do, Dave? Praise the Lord. Now we can start. And shame on the devil. Stephen and Amen. Mariah coming today? <laughs> we're just waiting. Johnny and so Johnny's downstairs. Stephen and Mariah, are they coming? Well, we're just getting ready for our prayer <laughs> to get started. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do we need prayer. <laughs> amen and amen. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne. <laughs> and uh, uh, the more I study your word, the more I realize anything I have, anything I know comes from you. And because uh, otherwise in myself, I am totally vacant. And uh, I thank you for your tender mercies upon me and, uh, and upon our church family here. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as you said in your word, that I think Psalm uh, 36, 9, in thy light shall we see light. So we pray, Lord, for the light of the Holy Spirit that dwells in each of us that are saved shine in your word today let us see light in your light be merciful to us now and help us we ask in christ's name amen, amen. okay let's see we're starting with verse nine uh and i think we're gonna just we're gonna try to get down to 12. have a little bit of fun here okay verse nine what then are we better than that no and no wise, but we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. As we get into verse 9, Steve ended up with verse 8 last week. And so uh, there's the, the big argument in the few verses above about, um, like in verse 5, but if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And he says, I speak as a man. God forbid... For then how shall, we, how shall God judge the world? For the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory. Why yet am I also judged as a sinner? 
and not rather, as we be slavishly reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. You know, we, we don't do sin, so God gets glory. Right. <laughs> we repent of sin, that God gets glory, because he is righteous. And uh, as I was reading through all of chapter 3 here this week, uh, the Holy Spirit eliminated verse um, 20, 21, 22. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, sometimes when bringing it up in today's church setting, you, you get the idea from the way it's taught from the pulpit, all right, that if you support the church and do things for the church, that's the rights that get, God gives to you. And it seems to be ingrained. And so we think in ourselves, well, if I, if I cut the grass, that's glory for God. If, if I do this work, if I do that work, and all of a sudden we lose fact of the sight that Christ is the only righteousness in the world. There is no righteousness that comes from any single law that we could ever pass. There's not a single law we could pass that would make anybody righteous. As, as we go into the verses here of uh, 10, 11, 12, and as we ever saw in verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when we come up to, back up to verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Now the we here is a reference to the Gentiles, and they is a reference to the Jews. And how we know that is because if we read further in the verse here, we'll find out the word of God is the greatest commentary on the word of God. No and no wise, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Leaves nobody out. And, you know, we, we have this concept in our head, guys, and I've seen it throughout most of my life, that if we do see someone that's doing extraordinary works for the Lord, well, they must be more holy and righteous than we are. And, and guys, our righteousness the righteousness that Christ gives to us in salvation is identical to, to, to all. You don't get, okay, we're going to give this guy 10 points of righteousness. Uh, John, you get five, and so-and-so, you get three, and we might give one and a half to this guy over here and a half over here. Well, that's right, because both all the false religions, they're working their way to heaven, so they have to do good works. I've worked with a lot of uh, Hindus in particular. Yeah. They... They go all day, every day, trying to do good works and outdo each other on who can do the, you know, do this, that, and the other thing. But it's because they have to, or they, you know, that's how they get to heaven. Yeah. Well, I read a, none of it. None of it gives righteousness. Not one of them. Not one thing. Well, I read a um, a comment from the communist, and the communist said Christianity is superior, superior to communism. He said, but the only reason why we're going to conquer the world and you aren't is because we're committed. We're willing to give up holidays. We're willing to work extra hours. We're willing, and he named all the things they're willing to do. You know, and if you guys already know this on most observations, most Christianity is lived out between 9 and 12 on Sunday. <laughs> the whole United States. And as soon as it's 12.01, <laughs> Now, fortunately, we go to Chinese. Otherwise, it's off to the chicken dinner. <laughs> okay? So, how committed is committed? You know, and each of us has to answer that. And uh, what I tried sharing with the revival, okay, is we have to draw the circle around ourselves. How far do we want to be revived? Okay? And then, at whatever point, you know from the Lord what's going on, then you look for somebody else to help bring into the path. So it doesn't matter if the person's been saved 50 years. You know, backsliding occurs all the time, it occurs everywhere. 
And it's so important for us to come to grips with delivering for the Lord. And we're afraid that if we really live 100% for the Lord, we're going to lose out on life. <laughs> okay? Sorry, but we have these strange things in the back of our head. There's strange things where we're programmed. And uh, there's only been less than five people in my whole life that I met that I really thought was on fire for the Lord. Or had, had really had the spirit of the Lord. I haven't met very many. You know what? And uh, I have to look at my own life. And I already know what the struggles are. I already know what the battlegrounds are. And, uh, and I like what Pastor Miller said last week when we had our after coffee downstairs. Um, he called up David Hockey, which is out in California. I, he, hopefully he's still alive. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I used to listen to his radio program when I had the opportunity, and I've got a couple of books by him. Solid stuff. I never had any problem with him whatsoever. After said, a certain point, that's a different issue, but he, he started out wrong and got right, and he'll tell you that himself. He changed the name of his ministry and everything. Super. Yeah. Most most people start off right and go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And if you go to Psalm 19, you find out the seed of destruction is already planted within us. And we pick choosing the tree of knowledge, good and evil, instead of the tree of life. And that's the real thing there. But uh, he called up David Hawking, and he said, I'd like to, or he would, he just wanted to talk to someone in the office. And he was asking about this other guy in the ministry. And, uh, and David Hawking said to him, you know, he's just like the rest of us. <laughs> he's got to wake up every morning, he's got to put his pants on, got to brush his teeth, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and <laughs> good night. In other words, he's no better or no worse than the rest of us. Right. And uh, and hey guys, that's the same thing with you, the same thing with me. We're just human guys. And I'm tickled pink if God uses me at all. I'm tickled pink. Because I've gone through so many ministries where it's uh, stay off the carpet, <laughs> get over here. Um, one pastor didn't like the hole that was in my sock. That was that was fascinating by itself, but I got pushed to a corner and it kept there. All right, that's uh, and I'm looking uh, just so like when we have our meeting here. Every time you breathe in and out, five people die in going to hell. And true revival is what we shared in Mark chapter two. Four guys got together, took an unsaved person, shared with him the gospel, brought him to Christ. He got saved, and as uh, Icing on the cake, he also got healed. All right? I don't think Christ would have healed him just to heal him. There, I think salvation had to occur first based on the way I, I perceive Scripture. And, uh, but I think that's fascinating uh, when you study all that. So as we go into verse 9 here, it says, For no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles. So I put down in the notes here, let's take a look at... Uh, Let's see if somebody can get Romans chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. That's a good question. <laughs> ah, all right, okay. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of unrighteousness. Yeah. Jew and Gentile. Uh, He's proved, he's been trying to prove since verse 17 and 18, all have sinned. And that's what he's going through. He's going through the two groups and going, all have sinned. John, you know, the funny thing is, over the years I've read numerous commentaries on Romans, and uh, recently, as we've been going through it, every time, every, every once in a while, once somebody teaches on Romans, it's amazing how complicated they make things when. Verse 9 really explains what he's trying to say in the previous few verses. And yet they'll go on for chapters, it seems like, you know, 100 pages about this. He's just saying we're all sinners. Yeah. And that when he teaches what the Jews and others obviously sense have accused us of, when we teach that Jesus will forgive your sins apart from any works. Yes. 
then they're saying, you mean you can sin, there's no consequence? Well, the consequence was Jesus had to die. Yeah. But what they'll accuse us of is saying, you know, what, like you said up in the verse above, um, you know, God, where does it say, uh, which verse was it? If our uh, unrighteousness can commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous and taking vengeance? And he goes on to basically say, uh, for if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie and his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? He's answering all these questions that we hear today in sometimes different words. But people who don't believe in eternal security, for example, they'll constantly say, You, you think you can live, live like the devil go to heaven? And I'm like, Yeah, I believe if you live like the devil and you're saved, you still go to heaven. The, 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 here's the, the gist of what they miss is you lose reward. And God could kill you and take you years before you otherwise would go to hell. Oh, yeah. And there's all kinds of other negative consequences. connotations and consequences to well, it. There's the Holy Spirit that that should convict you so you don't want to do that. Right. You know, and if you're not convicted, then you question whether you're sitting. But, but people do. I mean, people are right. convicted and they still ignore that. Yeah. And they can commit adultery. And we were talking about a fellow this morning that um, I was asking her about because I'd heard anything a long time. And, you know, uh, you can be a Christian and commit adultery and, and be a weirdo and go off and do crazy things for a while. God will work on you and work on you. And eventually he'll take you home if you, you know, don't get, get things right. So that that's what i'm just getting at is in this chapter when he he says yeah. these things he's answering the same questions we hear it may not be a jew asking it right it's a charismatic or a, a free will baptist who believes they can lose their salvation or a catholic you know who thinks that they're going to go to heaven because they do all these sacraments there you know? yeah it's well, a big deal because you know paul spends a lot of time answering that question you go back he'll come back to it in Romans six what yeah. shall we say then shall we the same question. But yeah, it's an important back. question. Yeah, it's a important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Romans is gigantic. It is. It's huge. It is a great, huge. great foundational piece right here. But um, John Wesley, um, you know, struggled for salvation <laughs> as a missionary going to America. So he comes back, he's in London, and he's just crying out to God about having to turn to salvation. And just did not have it. So he goes to a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night. And uh, they have Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. All the guy is doing is reading the preface. What Martin Luther wrote in the preface. <laughs> and that's how John Wesley got saved. And yet, even John Wesley and Martin Luther struggled with their own assurance after that. Because they yes. rejected eternal security. Yeah. And you have to remember during the Re during the Reformation days, uh, you had Catholicism everywhere, and they were controlling everything everywhere. And how many good Bible teachers were there in those time frames? And can you find your books today? All right, I have the uh, the 16th century homiletics from the uh, Episcopalian Church, and so I'm reading the first sermon in there, and my mouth drops. The first couple of pages of the sermon, we would call it a Baptist sermon. <laughs> and they're going so deep with the Word of God, and you're getting it. And I, I was amazed on how deep they were back in, in the 16th century. Totally amazed. But yet, you have to figure with Martin Luther, when he took a stand against Rome, he wasn't taking a stand, he just wanted to debate them. And it's just like today, nobody wants to pick up the debate. I can't tell you how many people I've tried to share the 200 track, you know, on, on, on the Bible changes, and they won't pick it up. Sure. They, they refuse to. Yeah. They like to live in La La Land. Willingly ignorant. Totally. Yeah. Because they're afraid they're going to lose something. And, uh, yeah. you know, I just have to shake my head on there, but Martin Luther did not know it at the time, but after the Reformation started, 90% of Germany was with them. Wow. 
You know, here in America, we think uh, we're going to be attacked and everything. But wouldn't it be nice to know if maybe 60% was with us? And the 60% is waiting for one person to say, I I'm taking a stand, it's not going any further. Yeah, keep everyone in a kind of storm. Yeah. I know in Canada, they're all waiting for someone else to take a stand up there. And they know the moment that guy takes a stand, he's going to jail with a $100,000 fine and he's bye bye. You know, uh, the only hope I can give to you is out of Galatians chapter 5, and it might be verse 24. And I like to meditate on it from time to time to time because verse 22 and 23 gives you the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ living within us. All right? And when you get to verse 24, it says, Against such, there is no law. There's no law that says you have to love one another. Because the Holy Spirit is indwelled in you, and it should be a natural byproduct with fellowship and with the Lord. That's the way it should be. And America didn't have as many laws <laughs> until after it turned away from the King James Bible. In 1901, look at, look at the freedom this Bible brought us up until 1901. And compare it with the freedom we have today, and tell me you're more free today than you were back then. Tell me, because we got rid of the King James Bible in 1901, we are so much smarter and more intellectual than any other generation in American history. I have a copy of the, uh, uh, let's see, of the pilgrims from the second generation, their meditations on God's word. And I am floored. I'm going, huh? It was, it's so rich. Now try finding those books today. They've been burned and gotten rid of a lot of them. But if you can find any stuff from them way back at that time frame, it, it is rich, rich meditations on God's Word. And I would just tell you right now, you'd be, you'd be blessed from the head of your head, you know, down to the soles of your feet. It's really that good stuff. Um, let's quickly take a look at Galatians 3.22. Galatians 3.22. Again, just a simple statement. Is anybody there? I'm there. We're great already. Okay, Johnny. 322? Yeah, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen and amen. Notice that the scripture, and another word for scripture is the word of God, and another word for scripture is the voice of God. Another word for scripture is Jesus Christ himself. Hath concluded all under sin. And I've got the word all underlined in my Bible because that destroys Calvinism. <laughs> One little single word. All have sinned. And you, the next word, which I probably should have your line as I'm thinking about, it, is the last word. Might be given to them that believe. Now, if I was a Calvinist, I would take out the word believe and I'd rewrite it to those that are chosen. Yep. Yeah. That's the way it should be written if you're a Calvinist. And once you tamper with the word of God, you no longer have the word of God. You have the word of man. Right now. But this, the way this applies to our text, isn't it saying you can't be saved unless you recognize you're lost? That, that the point he's making back in Romans 3 is that you're lost. Yes. And that your works can't save you. And we're not glorifying sin, but we're saying that you're all sinners. And therefore, the only way to be saved is by faith in Christ. Amen. And he's saying here, the scripture concluded all understand sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You can't believe, you can't be saved unless you recognize your you're lost. Concluded all and with all the rest of us under sin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ca capsulated. You yeah. know? And totally incredible. Let's take a look at of um, uh, next verse. Verse ten. Whatever you see it in the New Testament, as it is written. There's a difference because there are some parts of the New Testament where it says, uh, like, and Jeremiah said, you know, 
but you're not going to find it in the writings of Jeremiah. Right. And so there is a difference between the two, but that is now that it's put in the New Testament, it's now written. Yeah. <laughs> now written. So let's take a look at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So that is found in Psalm 14, 1, 2, 3. Anyone can find Psalm 14, 1, 2, 3. The psalm means praise. Fascinating stuff here. Um, first of all, if you take a look at verse 3, they're all gone aside, they're all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So notice the word here is filthy. All right, well, let's take a look back at Romans 3 12. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Notice how the Holy Spirit exchanges the two words. On one end, in the Old Testament, it's filthy, but now we come to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit decides to change the word to unprofitable. Fascinating. Now, this, this may or may not have occurred to you, uh, but it's a golden nugget out of God's word. Because you get into a fight with these people about, well, the King James Bible. Well, how about French? Do they have a King James Bible in French? Well, how about Ponga Nika Biko down in Africa somewhere, you know? Or how about some, some Asian country, Japan? Do they have a King James in Japanese? And guys, based on just this, these two verses compare, the answer has to be 100% yeah. Now, I've heard different translators say that they can't always find the exact word of that language to fit there, so they find something comparable. Well, if we have filthy here and unprofitable over here, then it must be okay to find something that matches in that language that's going to bring forth the truth of God to those people. You I'd know? say we had this conversation yesterday, though, John, and what I tell people is that you know, finding the closest word in your language um, is the purpose of translation but this is god's word yes so god can change it all he wants yes from old to new testament to make his point yes man changing it is where the issue is totally and Agreed. so that's where we have a problem when we look at an niv and it says the root of uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil yes, of, i remember that one that sort of mm -hmm. thing is the uh, question yesterday was Matthew 6 and Luke 11 give the what we call the Lord's Prayer and um, in one he says forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and in Luke he says forgive our sins our sins, our sins. Oh. and then in Mark uh, in Matthew 6 he, he says he ends it with for thine is the kingdom the power and glory forever Luke 11 that's missing and so people are shocked by that. I, I point out, first of all, it's two different events. On one, it's the, it's the uh, Sermon on the Mount. The other, they're off in some secret place. It's different. He's speaking at different times. But with that said, it's God's Word, and He can change and edit all He wants. Correct. So if you see something in the Old Testament like this, filthy, turned into unprofitable, it's because He's the author. He's allowed to do that. But the problem is when man changes it. Correct. And then the answer to those questions about translation is that's not a change. 
that they have found the word that in their language is closest Correct. to the text. Oh, absolutely. So they haven't changed anything. Correct. They're just giving as accurate a translation as possible. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I was going for. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I have no problem with it at all, but you're all right. It is funny, it just came up yesterday. Though. Yeah, we were having this conversation yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But so they, the, the reason they use that as an argument is try to prove that the King James is not the Word of God. Yeah, yeah and, that's right, pointed out. Yeah. And, and also, it, one of the arguments against the Bible is, oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they just copied each other. And that's, no. Yeah. That's not true. Either. And that's the proof right there. Read Matthew 6 and Luke 11. If they were just copying each other, they'd be the exact copies. Exactly. But they're not. They give you an accurate uh, re account of the fact that in one place, he used debt, debtor, uh, debts instead of sins. And in another place, he ended with nine as the king and power of the Lord forever. Amen. And in another yeah. place, he didn't. And that proves that they didn't just copy each other. <laughs> Totally. So you can't win for losing with some of these people, though. Their first accusation, when you answer it, then they'll use that as an I use uh, channel uh, 4, 6, and 10. I got different different witnesses see it. Exactly. Yeah. That's what it basically is. It doesn't mean it's error. It just means no. different accounts. No. no. Who can get Job 28 28? We're going to show you a nugget for um, Romans 3 11. It says here, there is none that understandeth. None. That understand oh, Job 28 28. Yeah, 28 28. You should I, not be able to forget that one. I found it. Okay, Jennifer. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Wow. First time I read that, it threw me for a loop. Because, <laughs> you know, there are times you're talking to someone and you say, Well, do you understand? And they'll just smile and nod their head. Oh, yeah, I understand. Well, according to Job 28, 28, if you understand, you're moving from point A to point B. You're not staying in the same place. Do you understand? That means get moving. Well, <laughs> in Romans 3, 11, it's talking about the unsaved man. Yes. Yeah, and that, that's what it is. The unsaved man does not understand. Right. Or he'd be running to Christ right now. There are times I've passed out gospel tracts, and it's like I, the one guy, I want to die and go to hell. Really? <laughs> no, you don't. You don't want to go there. Other people, I'll take my chances. You don't want, you don't want to take your chance. You cannot control. I read a statement in the last week or two where it says, death always comes as a shock. Because you didn't know what was going to happen at that moment. Yeah. You didn't know that was going to be your last breath. Yeah, but that person that said that, they had no wisdom and no understanding. Like, None. They would be running the other way. <laughs> totally. And all these people, they give all the time to all these groups trying to promote something. You know, they think that's like a form of righteousness. And it, it just can't happen. It's, uh, but depart for the unsaved person. Once you understand the fear of the Lord, that means you don't get saved, you're going down. Yet you have to understand means to move. You know, your feet's going to be on fire soon. There was a thing I shared with a friend of mine down in Cincinnati. He got a, he was a youth department pastor and he was called to a young man who was in the hospital dying. And uh, he was a Jehovah Witness. And he used to listen to this guy's radio program. She used to have the youth department take the chick tracks and enact them out on radio. Okay? Fantastic. So he gets a phone call from this guy and he runs down to the hospital and he gets stopped at the door by the guy's parents. And this guy is yelling to his parents, let him in. He said, there is a hell. He said, my feet are on fire. And in the next breath, he was gone. The parents stopped that kid from getting saved. Now later on, the two parents ended up getting saved. Too late for the son. Too late. Guys, it's... Uh, you don't know how quick. Hopefully, uh, we'll all make it to our China house. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Especially if it's the rapture, we don't go at the same time. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with we'll that. We we'll eat Chinese at the marriage supper. Amen. 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 The rapture can come now. Two minutes. Amen. Two minutes. For the rapture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to say it's a prophecy, but. Yeah, but it's well, not. It's not. But we don't want to. Yeah, we don't want to have to stone you. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I kind of want to keep my dad. Thank you. Two minute warning. All right. Okay, well, real quick, let's take a look at uh, Isaiah 53, 6 for verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. Hey, all sinners are out of the way. No amount of path on the right. No amount of travel on the wrong road will lead you to the right destination. No way. Isaiah 53, 6. You got it? All right. 53 6. 53 6. <laughs> All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. All we like sheep. See the word all again? All. Um, there was a famous. Uh, famous evangelist in the 1920s. And this one guy wondered never how to be saved and this famous evangelist had to get on the train. And so the evangelist yelled to the guy trying to, who wanted to know how to be saved. He said, turn to Isaiah 53, 6, start with all, and when you end it all, you'll be saved. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so there you have it. We're compared with sheep. Anything you can study about sheep will open up your understanding of the Word of God. Sheep are the dumbest critters around. Um, I mean, what is it they do? They, they do what the other person is doing. Yeah, take a look at the last verse of uh, Psalm 119, 176. This verse is someone uh, who was saved. Who was saved and recognizes he went the wrong direction. Can anyone find it? Psalm 119. I have gone astray like a lost a sheep, seek thy servant, for I do not forget the, uh, the commandments. Here's a guy that went astray, he saved, and what happened? He remembered the commandments. <coughs> And he's asking the Lord for help. Let's finish with a quote and a quick prayer. Here's what Martin Luther said about the Word of God I thought was good. Only a little of the first fruits of wisdom, only a few fragments of the boundless heights, breadths, and depths of truth have I been able to gather. Amen. Wow. He understood what a great book it was, and he just barely graced the top of it. Well, let's have a word for prayer. Heavenly Father, be merciful to us. And uh, may we always be in awe of your book. And may we always be challenged to know that there's so much more that's just waiting for us to, uh, to reach out and to be fed with. And the food from heaven is the same food that you want us to give to those around us. Amen. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. And bless the upcoming service for your glory. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Timeliners, farewell. We shall see you in a short bit.